Neuroendocrine tumors, or NETs, are rare and hard to diagnose. That's why many people have to live with the effects of NETs and their treatment for several years. I'm Richard Olden for the NET Report. This series is designed to help you understand NETs, their identification and treatment. In our previous reports, we asked what neuroendocrine tumors are, why they're often mistaken for irritable bowel syndrome, and how to diagnose them properly. In the final segment, we'll look at why doctors in several specialties are involved in treating this serious condition. Today, we're focused on the patients themselves. Once you're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor, what should you expect? What kind of treatment will you receive? How can you best handle the situation? This is the story of one net patient and her family, a family that went through a process of diagnosis, treatment, and taking personal responsibility for responding to the illness. It is a heartwarming family story with amazing grace. My name is Grace Mulligan. I live in Miller Place, New York. I'm 58 years old. I'm married. My husband is Hank. I have two children. Mary is 19 and Harry is 16. My family calls her Amazing Grace and she just doesn't let this stop her. Yeah, have fun. All right. All right, take care. See you later. Okay. It was kind of a gradual thing. I thought it had to do with menopause. I was getting hot flashes, but they were very severe. And just getting like fatigue and not feeling that great. So I would go to the doctor and he'd say, take soy or do this, do that. And it didn't, didn't work. They kept coming up with other uh, ideas that she's really not that sick. And I said, well, that just doesn't make any sense to me. I was being treated for colitis, symptoms of colitis. 2005 was when I was going downhill pretty fast. I went back to the doctor and he said, well, it could be an ulcer, it could be many things, but he sent me to a gastroenterologist who did a CAT scan of my abdomen, and then they found tumors in my liver. But I must have had it for a long time, like they say, 10 or 15 years, because the tumors were very large. We were both very much in shock when uh, we found out that she had cancer. I wasn't angry. I was confused, I was scared. I don't think you're ever prepared for that type of a diagnosis. All I kept thinking of was my children. They did a good job of keeping the hard stuff away from us. She was always really strong, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's been the best with that. We ended up going to see a specialist in carcinoid cancer, and that really, it changed my life. He said, the best thing to do is cut out whatever you can cut out and then from there see how it goes, like chemo and things like that. The original diagnosis was that uh, she was inoperable. So um, that's why it's important to find a doctor that specializes in your type of disease. We went with doctors who do liver surgery and intestinal surgery and heart surgery and all have patients with carcinoid. So I used all of those doctors and it turned out great. And those were my three big surgeries. That was a couple of years ago, I guess. And then after that, I've had no surgery. It's been chemotherapy. She's just happy and always and, and uh, just manages to, to do things as if nothing ever happened, which is kind of uh, amazing to see, it really is. I was an art teacher. Well, I was out sick and then I retired. And then I said, well, why don't I try to do my own painting? So I'm working on that. <laughs> but it's great. Winter trees without the leaves really excite me. So I was doing some, some of those. I started giving some of my favorite paintings away to people who, you know, watched my kids and helped me out, you know, and things like that. I go to Stony Brook University has a program for people who are retired and like I take classes in poetry and drawing and painting and art history and the things that I enjoy. And then of course the support group 
is very, very helpful for information. Um, you can see, you know, what other people are doing, what their doctors are doing. I am the vice president of the Carcinoid Cancer Awareness Network. We were founded in 2004. Our mission is to intensify awareness and to educate patients about carcinoid. When a newly diagnosed patient calls me, the first thing I tell them is to take a deep breath. It's going to be okay to know that they're not alone in this and that there are patients out there that are survivors and can get them through this. I belong to CCAN Carcinoid Awareness and they have meetings where you meet other people with the same cancer. And it may be in different spots, but they're all going through the same thing. And that helped a lot. It's very nice, it's very personal, it's very one of a kind. I make jewelry, and the theme of the uh, organization that has my mom's support group is a zebra. So we stuck with a black and white theme, made a bunch of black and white beads, and. Uh, we sold them. It helps my mom uh, not only just because we sold uh, it for some profit and then we gave it to the organization, but it's one of the things we do together, you know? When she got better to go out and stuff, we would go out to lunch and get her nails done, like the stuff we did before she got sick so that it still felt normal. And we'd go shopping, and even when she was sick and I would go shopping, I would go in and show her all my things and we'd get all excited. <laughs> she is always involved with the kids. He never complains. <laughs> when I first was diagnosed, you know, all those the petty little things of the day, they just flew away. Surround yourself with like beauty and joy and the things that make you happy. And that's kind of what I did. I would say everyone has to stick together and stay positive. It's hard, obviously, but that's the main thing, I would say. Yeah. It helps a lot to uh, know what everyone's thinking, you know? I had a lot of support from my family and my friends and my husband most of all. Every time we would go to the doctors the night before, he has all these papers out, all the latest tests, and he'd consolidate all the information onto pages, write a list of questions, and he'd write down all the answers. So he was great. He still is great. <laughs> Educating the doctors would be very helpful. I think that a lot of doctors are not familiar with it at all. And since the, um, the symptoms mimic menopause and uh, colitis and gastrointestinal types of diseases, that's always what they're looking to, uh, to cure. So, you know, you make the best of it. It's like, and it's really been great. I mean, it's kind of like childbirth when you're going through it. Not so great. <laughs> you really do appreciate like everything around you more, and nothing is a big deal, and everything is going to work out, and it just will. We're grateful for the courage and wisdom of Grace and her family, and for their helping others learn about and deal with the diagnosis and treatment of NETS. There's a lot more advice available for you through various support groups, advocacy organizations, and informational sites. And for more information, please go to the NET Community website. It brings together people from around the world to enhance awareness, understanding, and management of this disease. Be sure to watch the other segments of this important series so you can be your own advocate. They cover what NETs are, why NETs are often misdiagnosed, how they're properly diagnosed, and the multidisciplinary approach to treating this serious condition. This is Richard Olden for The Net Report.